All right, good morning. Welcome to Dad's shop. Uh, as you saw, it's, it's not as bad as I made it out to be, but, you know, it's got some character, we'll say. No, um, what I have here to show you is a, there's a little cold pits crystal oscillator that I built over the past couple of days. It looks pretty ugly, but it was a quick mock-up. The inspiration for this video is twofold. One, to flex some of my uh, engineering, radio frequency engineering knowledge. I got all these books out from the OSU library uh, for leaving for home because I want to learn some more stuff about communication circuits and uh, you know building your own oscillators and modulators, amplifiers, so that we can do some cool stuff later on, uh, later on in the semester. The other uh, inspiration is for the vacuum systems we've been using. As you saw in the previous video, if you haven't seen it, here's a link for it. Um, if you remember, in the beginning of the video, we had evaporated junk on the tube. You know, there was aluminum, uh, we had zinc on the tube. And even though we didn't want that, in that case, evaporating materials is actually very useful and it's used all over in industry and in research, uh, in the research field. So um, one of the pieces of technology that's used in evaporation in coating materials in vacuum is you want to know to nanometer precision or even less than nanometer precision how thick the material you deposit is and in order to do that what a lot of people use are piezoelectric discs and because as a pie and I'll talk about this in a little bit but the um, piezoelectric disc will change in frequency as materials deposit onto it and you can really you can measure that frequency very finely and you can know to 10 you know angstrom nanometer precision how much material you're depositing and that's how people um you you just calibrate the crystal and then you can deposit known amounts uh, known thicknesses of material onto whatever substrate target it may be so that's uh that's one thing we're going to explore today uh later in the video all right yeah so you may have seen or worked with crystals before here's a couple just examples this is like you know different package types and you can see on there, it's written, you know, this one says 3.57, this three and, you know, three and a half megahertz. This one says 3.775, it's 37 megahertz. But how these guys work is there's a little piezo, uh, there's a little quartz crystal in there. The crystal in there vibrates when a voltage is put across it. And likewise, when it vibrates, a voltage develops across the crystal. So these are really handy, they're used in, you know, touch sensors, microphones, um, all sorts of different applications in everyday life. And the, but I would say probably their biggest use, or at least their, yeah, probably their biggest use is in electronic devices with microprocessors, because these are the most common things that are used to keep track of time. They are, they're the metronome of your computer. So they're, you know, your computer's doing millions of operations, billions of operations a second. They're, they're keeping the time of when those operations happen. So, super useful. We'll do a lot more of these later, but for now, we're just building a circuit, a simple cold pits oscillator circuit that is needed because the crystal itself doesn't just oscillate when you put a voltage across it. It needs what's called positive feedback to keep the resonance of the crystal going. So, and, to, to, and also to amplify the resonant signal. And so this coal pits oscillator, I'll show the circuit on the screen right now. And uh, there's a link down in the description to the uh, PDF where I got this. There's a super helpful link. It'll tell you for different ranges of crystal frequencies what values you need in your coal pits oscillator. So you don't have to do any calculation yourself. I know it's kind of a cheap way to do it. But um, it'll tell you what values you need. And you can build your own coal pits oscillator. But... Um, this uh, little circuit I built, I can interchange the crystal in it, and I'll pull up on the scope here for you. The circuit uh, is just the one you saw in the PDF, and I'm putting four volts across it. So here's a, I put in a 10 megahertz crystal. Here's 10 megahertz. Um, I've got frequency down here in the bottom of the uh, screen of the scope, and voltage peak to peak is about uh, 200 millivolts per division, so you can see. So that's not bad, five, you know, point, point 0.6 volts. Um, that's pretty healthy oscillation right there. So let's see if we can do a couple different ones to get to the chase here. So here's an eight megahertz crystal that I tore open.
Alright, so here's what that guy looks like now. It's, uh... I just peeled back the metal casing to reveal... And there's a little bit of black Sharpie on there from... I was previously doing an experiment, which I'll show you in a second here, but... Um, you can see the, uh... Little piezo disc in there. Maybe. And so that's all that there is to it. So I'll plug this back in. There's our oscillation. So... We've got our oscillation that's really cool. The next thing we want to try though is I want to see if we can get the frequency of oscillation to change by changing the mass on the piezo disc. And so for that, we're going to take to the frequency counter. All right, so we've got a stable oscillation, oscillation looks like. Um, it's a little bit lower than 8 megahertz because again, I said I was messing with it yesterday, um, but that's corresponds to seven megahertz. 7.967 megahertz and we've got some extra digits here. So this will be nice. We've, we've got basically hertz precision on this. 7967445. Okay. Let me go ahead and just draw a line on the crystal. And Hopefully it'll come back. It's got to come back to oscillation. Oh geez. Okay. All right. So one comment I will make is the reason you see it increasing is because the the, the hypothesis is that there's solvents, there's organic solvents that the, the Sharpie company dissolved their um, their dye into, and those solvents right now are. Uh, evaporating they're very volatile they're evaporating off of the surface of the crystal so we're gonna see basically a decrease in mass as this uh, so the frequency is gonna go up and um, this does make sense though we were at nine uh, or um, nine six seven and now we're at nine six three so we've gone down a whole almost four megahertz or I'm sorry four kilohertz this digit hit here and um, so that corresponds to what we would have would have guessed if we model this as a basic, you know, uh, spring mass damper system, and you add mass to it, or it'll it'll slow down the frequency oscillation. So, this is good. You can still see it's increasing, and this will level out. We can come back to this in a minute, and it will uh, it will have leveled out. All right. So, came back after it's been about ten minutes, and we have a nice steady frequency of six uh, six four and a half, and we were at six seven and a half. So we get about delta F equals three kilohertz. So that's pretty good. That's measurable. Let's, I'm gonna do it again. So here goes a little bit of a line. So it's rapidly coming back up. But notice we were at 64, now we're at 60. So we'll come back in a minute and see what we got. All right, it appears to have found a comfort zone around the 3,000, the 3 kilohertz mark, the 7963. So still delta F now is 1.5 kilohertz. Okay, today's tomorrow, it is Christmas day. Let's do a quick analysis of our measurement. We, uh, we had two readings, uh, one was one and a half kilohertz, one was three hertz. So now we wanna know roughly how much material we deposited and what our sensitivity is. How uh, small changes of mass or of a thickness of a layer of material can we measure with our uh, with our sensor here. So, we quick analysis is that this the, the diameter of this quartz crystal is about a you know a seven tenths of a centimeter in diameter and one millimeter. We're going to call the width of the line that we drew. Okay, you'll see why that's important in a second because we're going to calculate the volume of the urethane layer that we put down basically of the stuff that's left behind after the alcohols evaporate off of the, uh, the Sharpie line we draw. So um, from a video that's down in the description, uh, a guy uses a, uh, a special gauge to measure the thickness of lines of a line of Sharpie. We're gonna call the, the thickness of a line a rough three microns um, estimate. And so if we come down here and say that the urethane the resin and the ink that's left behind is approximately one gram per cubic centimeter of density, in terms of density, then we can calculate the volume and thus the mass. 
So the volume is 0.1 centimeters times 0.7 centimeters times 3e e to the minus 4 centimeters, length, width, height, or thickness, to get the volume of our Sharpie line. And if the density is 1 gram per cubic centimeter, then the volume is approximately the mass as well. So we got what 0 0.02 milligrams of Sharpie residue left on the piezoelectric disc. And we were seeing changes of approximately two kilohertz, you know, between one and a half and three kilohertz um, change in frequency for that given change in mass. Then we can do uh, delta M over delta F and see our essentially, essentially our sensitivity. So our sensitivity is one gram per, or uh, one e to the minus eight grams per hertz is like our sensitivity. And if we're gonna we're gonna call the Say there's, you know, these are all just rough numbers. We're just trying to get an idea of our rough sensitivity of the system. So if we say that there's an error of like 10 hertz, you know, just inherent noise in the uh, frequency counter and in the oscillator we have, um, then we're going to multiply the 10 hertz error by this, by the uh, sensitivity. And so this 1e e to the minus 7 grams, that's the, the smallest change in mass that we can measure, the smallest delta m. Okay, so now we just recalculate for a given uh, material, we can tell what will the delta, the delta thickness be for the given delta M that we can measure. So we're gonna be plugging delta M in on the side here, and we're gonna move the area and density over. This is just volume times density. So we're gonna move area and density over to the right-hand side. So we have delta T, delta thickness equals delta M over AD. Uh, where A is the volume, or I'm sorry, where A is the area of the line and D is the density of the material. And we're going to say the density is, uh, we'll call it 10 grams per cubic centimeter. That's just like some, you know, metal, like it's between like silver and copper or something, we'll say. And we'll say the area is 0.385 centimeters squared. That's just the uh, 0.7 centimeters squared times pi is all that is. Okay, so we get this this block here, and then that gives us 2.6 e to the minus 8 meters, or 26 nanometers. So, there you have it. We are you know, just, just by rough survival math, we were able to give a rough estimate. Maybe we're in the, within an order of magnitude, you know, maybe we're doing nanometer, you know, nanometer precision measurement of this, uh, of these thin films. So, I don't know. I think that's pretty cool that we can... <laughs> we can measure those thickness changes. Um, again, this was rough. We just kind of mocked this oscillator together and this was probably uh, a quick analysis, but that gives you a rough idea of what you're able to do in your home shop. You know, we'll, uh, we'll probably keep going with this, additional experiments with this, but until next time, thanks for watching. Merry Christmas. Like, subscribe, and uh, tell a friend. Bye.